Well, I'm under marching orders to make this brief, so I decided to do that. But I wanted to say it is a very, very great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Professor Sam Ting of MIT, who is one of the world's preeminent experimental physicists with uh, a great deal of experience and beautiful discoveries in elementary particle physics sustained over an entire career. The, uh, he, he was awarded the, uh, along with Burton Richter of Stanford, uh, Sam was uh, awarded the 1976 Nobel Prize in Physics. And I'll read you the very brief part of the citation, which is essentially says as follows. For their pioneering work in the discovery of a heavy elementary particle of a new kind. Now, in putting this into context, this was a real game changer. This was the onset of the discovery of heavy quarks. Quarks make up the, uh, 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 th uh, the uh, protons and the neutrons. Protons and the neutrons make up the nuclei. And this led to the understanding of the strong force which binds nuclei together. And it was a wonderful discovery. It really electrified the community of not only particle physics, but all of physics. And we were all very, very excited about the, this, even those who, of us who are not working in particle physics. Well, the uh, discoveries were made at the uh, synchrotron in Brookhaven by the Ting Group and, and the uh, Stanford Accelerator by the Richter Group in two different locations, and, uh, and they agreed with each other. And very, very many beautiful uh, uh, spectroscopic type studies were later made on these particles, on this particle that had been discovered. Now, uh, more recently, we just heard from Senator Hutchison, uh, Sam was no longer satisfied with earthbound accelerators. So he decided to uh, be involved in the in the in the uh, in, in, and be a leader, basically, of the spectrometer, which is now on the space station. And and we were all uh, Senator Hutchison referred to this, and, and we were all quite amazed at that that, that Sam's persistence and uh, was able to get this thing on board the space station. And uh, it's going to be a very, very exciting thing. And I, I was glad that the, that, uh, that the data is already being taken, and we expect new and exciting discoveries to ensue. So I hereby introduce Sam Ting, and it's going to be a real, it's going to be a real pleasure to hear what he has to say. So good luck. It is a great honor for me to be here. This is the second time I'm here. Last time was January 5th, 2007. And the senator just uh, was there. <clears throat> so what I would like to do to, today is to share with you on science on the US International Space Station National Laboratory. The space station has the size of three football fields. It, the construction cost is about $100 billion. Through the effort of Senator Hutchinson, now there is a physical science experiment known as AMS. Let me try to locate it here. So Senator Hutchinson was responsible in 2005 for designating the U.S. portion of the International Space Station as a national laboratory, and in doing so, confirmed the important role of science on the space station, and more importantly, U.S. leadership. This laboratory, with its capability to support many kinds of scientific research, including complex modern accelerator type ex experiment is a unique facility. To honor this landmark legislation, I would like to report to you on the progress of a modern accelerator type experiment on the U.S. 
ISS National Laboratory. The development of accelerators for fundamental physics research started exactly 400 years ago. <laughs> the first accelerator has very low energy, but perhaps has done the most important work. The accelerator still exists today. The largest accelerator is called Large Hadron Collider at CERN Geneva, produce energy of seven trillion electron volts, abbreviated as seven TeV. This is to study the fundamental building blocks of nature. So after 400 years of effort, we now know atom has electrons outside, inside there's nucleus, inside the nucleus there are particles, inside the particle there are quarks. We also know every particle has an antiparticle. Every nuclei has an antinuclei. The unique potential of the US ISS National Laboratory to conduct fundamental scientific research with the precision charged particle cosmic rays. You can visualize this by remember there are two kinds of cosmic rays traveling through space. Neutral cosmic rays, light rays and neutrinos. Light rays has been measured over 60, 50 years. Fundamental discoveries has been made. But then there are charged cosmic rays, which is a new region in science. The infrastructure on the US ISS National Laboratory can support an accelerator type magnetic spectrometer, AMS, for a precision long duration, 10 to 20 years, study of high energy charged cosmic rays. In other words, all our knowledge today consists of light rays, and this part we will study very precisely. The largest accelerator on Earth, LHC, can produce particles of seven trillion electron volt, and this is has a circumference of 16 miles. However, cosmic rays with energy of 100 billion trillion electron volt has been observed. Therefore, no matter how large accelerator you build, you cannot compete with cosmos. So the highest energy particles are produced in the cosmos. So this it's a US-led international collaboration, consists of 16 countries, 60 institutes, about 600 physicists. It started from Finland, Denmark, Holland, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Romania, Germany, Russia, Korea, Taiwan, United States, Mexico, and so forth. We have a large Texas part. We have very strong support from NASA Johnson Space Center, Mr. Trent Martin and Mr. Kim Bowick, they are sitting there. And also University of Texas, Stephen Weinberg, and Rice University, Neil Lane, George Abbey, and Texas A&M, Joe Newton, Ed Fry, and Peter McIntyre. There is an article in Washington Post in December 2007, a remark by Steve Weinberg, which said, this device could make discoveries that are earth-shaking. We have an opportunity now to do something worthwhile fundamental science on the space station. The Johnson Space Center spent more than 17 years effort to support this experiment. As the senator mentioned, AMS was removed <coughs> from the shuttle manifest in October 2005. It was ultimately restored in January 2007 because of the leadership and vision of Senator Hutchinson to obtain the unanimous support of AMS from the United States Senate and House. And the strong endorsement by the world's leading scientists 
institutes and space agencies, including space agencies from Germany, from France, from Spain, from Italy, from Switzerland, also NASA Johnson Space Center, the Department of Energy, and also MIT. This is the congressional record in, for the 109th Congress, which has remarked by Senator Hutchinson, the alpha magnetic spectrometer scheduled to attach to the space station. This device takes advantage of unique space environment to measure and to understand the characteristics of matter in the universe. In other words, if you spend $100 billion to build something, you should use it. <laughs> so the legislation unanimously approved by the U U.S. Senate and House is called H.R. 6063, additional flight to deliver the alpha magnetic spectrometer and other scientific equipment and payload to the International Space Station. So AMS has 300,000 channel of electronics, 650 microprocessors, it has a dimension of 15 feet by 12 feet by 9 feet, weighed 7.5 tons. It is a twinning electron volt precision multipurpose spectrometer. As you all remember in high school, particle and nuclei are defined by their charge and energy. On top is a detector identified electron positrons. There's another set of detector, measure charge and energy, and then nine layers of silicon detector measure charge and energy, a magnet measure the sign of charge, and something called rich measure energy, charge and energy, and electron magnetic calorimeter measure energy of the electron positron and gamma ray. So energy and charge are measured independently by many detectors. The data acquisition in space, to read out 300,000 channel up to two kilohertz, our team developed large set of computers which are programmable from the ground and which read out all different detectors. Hundreds of these computers are interconnected in a tree-like structure which, with the AMS developed 100 megabit per second serial link. High efficiency power supply were also developed by the AMS team. You need to remember in space, if something goes wrong, you cannot send a student to fix it. <laughs> the thermal control computers. One of the major challenges of operating in space is the extreme temperature environment which the experiment is exposed. So we also developed computers which are programmable from ground. These computers read out 1,000 temperature sensors and con control 300 heaters. The first detector is called transition radiation detector, identified electron positrons. And they are made of 9,000 stored tubes. Out of 9,000 stored tubes, 5,000 were selected. They are two meters in length, is central to 100 microns. How do you make sure? You do this by putting them into a hospital at night, as, as if they are patients, and make sure the wires are centered. Onboard processing for this part of the detector is by 30 computers, measuring 5,000 signal pulses, 500 temperature sensors, eight pressure gauges, and controlling 24 heaters uh, and valves to keep the signal uniform to 1%. Remember, there's a great variety variation of temperature in space. Another detector called silicon tracker major coordinate to 10 microns, a very small fraction of the thickness of your hair. It takes about 50 engineers three years to build this detector. This detector has 200 computers, 
measure 200,000 signals and 20 laser locations, 140 temperature sensors, and four pressure gauges, and 32 heaters. And this is to measure the coordinate to 10 micron. When you measure the coordinate in 10 micron, you need to know where the plants are moving. And this is done with 20 lasers to, move, to know its location to 3 micron. A rain image current of counter is controlled by 28 computers, measure 22,000 pulses to identify the nuclei by the thickness of the ring and energy by the diameter of the ring. A calorimeter is made out of 50,000 optical fiber, one millimeter in diameter, uniformly distributed in 1,200 pounds of lead. Onboard computing is via 32 computers and 3,000 uh, 3, pulse heights. And this is to measure energy of electron and gamma rays to one trillion electron volt. In total, there are 650 computers, 300,000 channels. It's a 10-year effort by 75 engineers. And there are 400% redundancy. And they are very fast. They are 10 times faster than the commercial space electronics. So once this was done, we sent the detector to the European Space Agency Electromagnetic Interference Chamber to make sure our computer generated signals does not interfere with NASA signal. We received very strong support from the European Space Agency. And this is a letter from the Director General, Jean-Jacques Dordain, to me, which said, I confirm that I grant the highest priority to AMS in providing its access to Aztec Test Center as soon as possible in order for you to make your deadline. And then we put in to a thermal vacuum chamber to simulate space, and for 14 days, the, temper the pressure is one billionth of the pressure on Earth, namely truly vacuum. The temperature goes from minus 135 degrees to 104 degrees. After that, we brought the detector back to CERN to the accelerator complex and to make sure you can measure all the nuclei at different energies. To do that, the management of CERN has to make a decision, and this is from the Director of Accelerator and Technology. There is a decision for the director level to give maximum possible amount of help to AMS. From this test, we know the coordinate resolution is 10 micron, the velocity resolution at the speed of light is known to one part in a thousand. You can measure energy of the electrons from 10 billion electron volt to 300 billion electron volt with two, per, two to three percent accuracy. And you can also identify all the nuclei. The detector was too big for 747, and so the US Air Force, together with DOE, supported us with the C-5 flight to transfer AMS from Geneva to Kennedy Space Center. And this is the front page of Tribute to Geneva, and show they have not seen such a big airplane before, so it was a big sensation for them. And uh, the US Air Force actually is quite proud of the fact they have supported us, and they have an exhibit of AMS at headquarters of the Air Mobility Command. At Kennedy Space Center, we put AMS on the space station simulator, make sure everything fits. And if you don't do that, you may regret it once in space. <laughs> so this is my last meeting with Shuttle Commander Mark Kelly before the flight, and this is one of my contributions to NASA. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, I do want to mention the former NASA director, the NASA administrator, Dan Golden, who realized at the beginning the unique potential for space station for fundamental science 
and has supported us from the beginning. And this is a picture taken in 1994, and somebody from France, from Russia, from Italy, from Germany, from Taiwan, from Switzerland, from Spain, from Korea. And this is the day the space station was launched. Uh, AMS was sent to space. And this is my son who is here today. So during the launch on May 16th, the total weight of the shuttle system is 2,008 tons. And using 2,008 tons to carry 7.5 tons into space. Perhaps it's not the most efficient way to do that. <laughs> so on May 19th, AMS was installed on the space station at 5 a.m. After four hours of intensive check, we decided to take data. And what made this possible is the lady behind the picture. And Senator Hutchinson come to visit us with, with the control center with uh, Captain Mark Kelly. And here shows in your control room the location of the space station and the particles passing through. And Senator Hutchinson is the one who made this possible. On the, in the Scientific America in May, and there's a little description of AMS. In eight months, we have collected over 10 billion cosmic ray events. It's because the detector is so large, it's about the size of your table. And because there's so many precision instruments, after all, it takes $2 billion to build it. So this is the, the green lines the event collected, and the, blue, uh, no, the, the blue lines the event collected, <coughs> The green line is the event reconstructed, meaning the signal goes through, you can put them together. So the detector functions perfectly. So the first data from AMS and detector performance. The detector form, perform, detector functions exactly as designed, and in eight months, we have collected 10 billion charged cosmic rays. And this is a about 10 times more than the charged cosmic ray collect previously collected combined. Every year, we will collect 16 billion charged cosmic rays, and in the next 10 to 20 years, we will collect a few hundred billion charged cosmic rays. And this will provide a very precise search for new physics. One of the physics is the search the search for origin of dark matter. We heard yesterday, 90% of the matter in the universe is not observable. Because it's not observable, we call it dark matter. A galaxy as seen by telescope looks like this. But if you can see the other 90%, the galaxy may look like so. Cosmic rays consist of protons, electrons, and helium, and so forth. Collision of cosmic rays will produce positrons. How to search for origin of dark matter? Collision of dark matter will produce additional positrons. And these additional positrons can be measured very accurately by AMS. The leading candidate for dark matter is called neutralino. The collision of neutralino will produce excess in the spectra of positrons different from collision of ordinary cosmic rays. So if you look at the positron production, compare with the positron energy, then this will be the contribution from ordinary cosmic ray collision. And this deviation shows you have understood the origin of 90% of the matter. This is an event of electron at extremely high energy of one trillion electron volt. You know the electricity you use is 100 electron volt, and so this is a rather high energy. This is the front view, this is the side view. The track goes through TRD, 
identified the electron. There are nine points go through the tracker, measure the momentum of the electron. Reach, measure the charge of the electron. This detector identifies the electron and measure its momentum. And therefore, this is the electron, this is the electron, and this momentum matches with this momentum. So you have multi-screening to make sure everything's done correctly. And this is a 200 50 billion electron volt positron. Another physics goal of AMS is to search for antimatter universe. We all know the universe began with the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang, there should have been equal amount of matter and antimatter. AMS on the space station for 10 to 20 years will search for the existence of antimatter to the age of observable universe. Now, in order to search for antimatter, you better make sure your detector is sensitive to ordinary matter. So this is measuring on the space station a ring. The thickness of the ring shows it's a silicon. The diameter of the ring shows it's 136 billion electron volt. And this is the spectrum of helium. As the space station traveling around the Earth near the equator, the particle coming in perpendicular to the magnetic field, and so the flux increase with decrease in energy because it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, then it spins away. When you go to more north, it's more parallel to the magnetic field, so the cutoff becomes less and less. You will imagine this cutoff will drop to zero, but no, it does not drop to zero, it ends in a finite place. And also, this part is helium-4, and this is helium-3. It's a very strange phenomenon, very difficult to understand. We just observed that. Notice this go to 2,000 billion electron volt. And so this is the measurement very simple measurement of the periodic table in space. And once you know this, you know you can measure the antimatter part. Let me share with you my understanding of discoveries in physics. When I start doing physics, the highest energy accelerator is a 30 billion electron volt proton accelerator in Brookhaven. Their original purpose, the expert's opinion, is to study nuclear force. The discovery with precision instrument is two types of neutrinos, breakdown of time reversal, symmetry, and new form of matter. That's the one. The all three were given Nobel Prize. The last one is from me. For the 400 GeV proton accelerator and Fermi National Laboratory, the original purpose the expert's opinion is to study neutrino physics. What was discovered was the fifth and sixth type of quark. The electron-positron collider at Stanford, the original purpose is to study property of quantum electricity. What was discovered is the quarks inside proton, fourth family of quarks, and third type of electron. The large electron positron collider in Hamburg, the original purpose was to look at the six, six type of quarks. What was discovered was the gluons carry the forces among quarks. The large underground cave in Japan originally was to look for lifetime of proton. What was discovered was neutrino has mass. Even the Hubble telescope, the original purpose was to do galactic survey. And what was discovered was the flat coverage of universe and the existence of dark energy. So when you build a new facility, you ask what's leading expert to see what you can do. And when you, do a, when you have a major discovery, it never has anything to do with its original purpose. <laughs> the reason, if you think about it, it's very simple. Because expert's opinion is based on existing knowledge. What you want to do is to jump ahead of the existing knowledge. So exploring new 
territory with a precision instrument is a key to discovery. And this is main reason why you want a, such a precise detector. So Cosmos is the ultimate laboratory. Cosmic ray can be observed at energies higher than any accelerator. So the most exciting objective of AMS is to probe the unknown, to search for phenomena which exist in nature that we have not yet imagined nor had the tool to discover. Finally, let me mention, on behalf of the AMS collaboration, I want to thank Senator Hutchinson for her leadership and support which made AMS a reality. In the next 10 to 20 years, AMS will provide us with a deeper understanding of our universe. Thank you. I think there's time to take questions for a few minutes. Anybody with any questions? Yes, sir. Reviving uh, the uh, ill fated uh, accelerator that uh, was uh, underway in Texas at one time? Uh, I'm not qualified to say that. <laughs> hmm? And uh, I made a major effort to work at the SAC, and it has closed. But the SAC is doing something really unique, okay? it has a much higher energy than. Uh, than accelerator at CERN. So that, that void has yet to be filled on Earth. Yeah. And, and, and may or may not be satisfied with the results from the AMS. Uh. Yeah, I think uh, it's, really, it's really, really too bad SSC is closed because the United States has lost its leadership in this very important field. Thank you.